welcome to the Pub Date Podcast, the show where two book broads discuss what should happen before, during, and after your book publication date. Brought to you by Broad Book Group, with your hosts, Vanessa Campos and Jen Dorsey. Hello, hello, everyone. How, how are you doing, Jen? Hello. Uh, happy almost weekend. I am doing well. I'm ready for this weekend. I am locked and loaded and ready. How about you? Oh, same, 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 same. The holiday season, when the, the spooky holiday season is kind of over. So now we're all turning our attention to Christmas because who thinks who thinks about Thanksgiving these days? I don't know. I feel bad for Thanksgiving. Like it's like the middle child that doesn't, <laughs> <laughs> doesn't get the attention. Yet I love it. I love Thanksgiving. Like it's just a nice... Just a nice holiday. I don't have to go buy stuff. I can just, I can just eat pie and I can watch football. It's oh, kind of great. Pie, yeah. I I'm looking forward to the cheesecake factory has this really great pumpkin pie pecan cheesecake. Ooh. I get my slice every year because you know too much is too much. But right, shopping. It's the, tis the season to go shopping. Tis the season to go out and buy all of your Christmas presents before it's too late. That's right. Tis indeed. I just I. Even though I say that I'm like I'm not in the Christmas spirit yet, I did go and look at TJ Maxx yesterday and maybe went ahead and bought a few items. So uh, I love it. I love going to weird stores. That's my favorite yes. thing. Well, and it, I think the season actually forces you to start thinking about like, okay, who is the person that's going to get this present or that present? So then you start going into specialty stores because you start thinking about the individual. Right. Then, you know, you walk into places like Urban Outfitters for the preteen that, you you know, you normally don't walk into an Urban Outfitters. You go into the REI, you go into the TJ Maxx, you go into all of these wonky places that you normally wouldn't go to. And you know what they all have in common around this time? Too much inventory? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Things I don't need, but uh, love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they also have books is something that i've been noticing they do this is the most random thing when you walk in to get a preteen something at urban outfitters and then you see everything from your youth like i don't know um cassettes mm -hmm. and cassettes at urban outfitters but then you walk around and you see some books some really beautiful coffee table books right right yeah it's it's always interesting to me in fact on my tj maxx trip yesterday um i noticed they had some really beautiful cookbooks they had like the mm -hmm. magnolia table cookbook and you know some of those higher end ones like the chrissy teigen one and um just some really beautiful ones that they don't normally carry any other time of year so i was psyched to see it oh yeah and you know that that that's always the question that we get it's like okay i have a great cookbook and yes it's cool to have it in at the uh bookstores and libraries and all the regular places but what about what about the home goods what about the TJ Maxx? What about, you know, I mean, even Costco. Mm -hmm. Right. What about your local, um, your local cookware shop? Like if you have a, like a cooking store or something like that. Um, I think that's something we should unpack today. Let's unpack some weird, funky, non-bookstore retailers and how you do it, how you get into those. Yes. Let's talk about it. So hmm, this is a non-traditional conversation. Right. Non-traditional, non, is that the right thing? Non-retail, no, not, not your usual suspects. Right. Non-traditional retailers. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Teamwork. <laughs> Teamwork makes the dream work, especially on a Friday when you're just like, it's done. It's over. Right. Um, okay. So earlier I had said, I need to go into certain stores because I know certain people like certain things. But that is actually the mindset that you should have if you have a book that you think could be sold in a very particular or a specialty store, like, right? right? So you have to start thinking like, okay, what's in my neighborhood? What What is, you know, what is the right place that you've had that relationship? And this is where you start thinking like a publisher, right? Exactly. So let's give them an example of something that you and I are working on. You know, it's been kind of top secret for a minute, but mm -hmm. we're getting ready to launch as a traditional publisher. And one of our books is actually a uh, a running book. It's it a is. Memoir. And it's interesting because it's like, oh, 
This could live outside of a Barnes and Noble. It could live outside of a bookstore that, you know, is your corner mom and pop indie bookstore. So we start thinking about the, the, the individual, the runner. Where do they shop? Where do runners run when they need things? I think they go to REI. I think they go to places like that. I am not a runner, uh, as anyone who knows me can attest. But we're going to get into the mindset of the runner to figure out where else we can sell this book. And I think that's what, no matter what your book is about, that's what you need to do. You need to kind of go back to, oops, I just hit my mic, sorry. Kind of go back to, you know, those early days when maybe you were writing your book proposal or you were trying to figure out what your book was you thought about audience, right? So I think you kind of have to revisit that topic again once you're ready to go out and talk to retailers. You have to think, okay, who's my buyer? Who's my reader? Where do they go? What do they like? What don't they like? You know, are are they Home Goods TJ Maxx people? Are they REI people? Do they like to shop at their local running store, for example, um, to go buy their shoes locally? You know, where do they go? What do they do? Even down to like, what are the restaurants Ooh. they like to go to? Because all of these things kind of give you some good market insight into what that avatar is for that ideal buyer. And that can help you then make some decisions about some of these funky, cool, different places that you can sell the book. Oh, yes. Actually, you, you said that like food. I walked into a Pete's and they had their own book. And I was like, wow, this is beautiful. It's it's a how to like it, it was a history of the of the bean and the process and and how they do it. And it's it was kind of interesting, but you think about it, you're waiting in the line, you're seeing all the uh, all the instruments that you need to use, and then you see this beautiful little book, and it's just like, you get that for your coffee lover, you're like, boom, done. Christmas right? shopping list, done. Exactly, exactly. And I think, you know, that brings up a good point, which is not only should you think about the audience and who your ideal reader is, but like, what are some adjacent... I'm not looking for, I'm not finding the right words today. It's Friday. What are some adjacent <laughs> um, products that maybe would go well with your book? Yes. Um, that can give you an idea of where else to sell your book. So if we go back to the running book example, okay, we know that runners like to buy accessories, right? Maybe they like to buy like a camel pack water thing, or they, I mean, they obviously go buy shoes because they go through a lot of shoes, you know, they go through gear, um, you know, all of that stuff. So what are some stores that sell those things? Or, or maybe somehow adjacent to those things where you can sell it. Right. So, and, and that also helps you talk to the person who is buying the merchandise at the, those specific stores. And it's like, Hey, my audience is very like, this is around the time of the year that they start gearing up for X, like the, the running season and mm -hmm. the cold season for, you know, for runners that are out there running in the snow, God bless you. Um, you know, maybe you know, that's a really good place to position this book. Um, it's it's really a conversation and, and educating the person who is also going to be the person to buy X number of books for their store. Or we can get into the weeds of like how how to actually like how that money comes into play. Because I've, I've heard and maybe you can uh, help me with this because I know that you do some really fun stuff with uh, with some bigger um, companies like Menards. Um, but I've heard of of indie authors and self published authors who have something that's very hyper focused on like their community, and they'll walk into an, a bookstore or a specialty store that's selling running shoes, and you know maybe the conversation is yes, I can buy this book through your distributor, which is Ingram. If you are self publishing, they will definitely do that, mm -hmm. or maybe they talk to you about a consignment, right? Right. There, there's a lot of ways that you can do it. I think if you're working with a retailer <clears throat> like an REI, like, you know, it's a bigger like national brand retailer, yet kind of like non-traditional in the sense that it's not a bookstore. Most of those folks can work through your distributor, through the specialty sales team. Um, so anytime you see a book in Target, in um, Home Goods, in TJ Maxx, in REI, most of those are, are coming through bigger distributors like Ingram. There's a whole team dedicated to that. So they're, you know, they're funky and non-traditional and that they're not bookstores, yet they are still big retailers. But if you're going to talk to local folks, if you're going to talk to your local um, running store or your local cooking store, then yeah, just, just go in and make the intro. And normally they will, they will, they'll do one of two things. They'll either take them on consignment and say, Hey, I'll take 10 books, you know, and if we sell them, then, you know, we'll pay you. 
or they may just buy tin and keep them on mm-hmm. on their floor. And to, so to do that, you kind of also have to think like a, a publisher again, as, as you mentioned before, and you have to give them a discount. They are not going to buy it for full right. price. So you're going to have to offer them you know, maybe a 50% discount on the book to get it into their store. But nine times out of 10, it's going to have really good placement. It's going to have good point of sale placement right by the register. I even went into my kid's karate studio this week and they were selling books. Uh, written, <laughs> they were written by the man who founded the karate studio. So, you know, you can buy a book anywhere. It's just a matter of making that relationship and, and seeing what makes financial sense for both parties. Yes. Always know your numbers. And that's, that's the thing. It's like, don't take it and don't, don't get offended if they're like, Hey, yeah, I don't just don't have the space or this doesn't sell. That's a good conversation to have. Like you should know what sells in their stores and that could just strike up a conversation. Like, Hey, can I talk to the buyer? I'm a local author. Um, this is what my book is about. And that's where a tip sheet comes into play. Um, you know, it's your one sheet that has a book cover on it and it has all the details on it, how long the book is, page count, trim size. It's, it's nice to have. It's an instructional manual for the person buying. It is absolutely. And, you know, speaking of making those relationships, there are some other great venues that you can sell books at, um, that are very relationship focused. And by that, I mean, associations and corporations. Yes. And for our business authors, chances are you're already part of the associations and corporation um, groups and networks that Mm -hmm. are likely going to buy your book. You just need to ask. And I think that a lot of people don't like asking. I would agree with that. And and maybe what they don't realize is that if they are a member of some kind of association that's related to their brand or their topic or their business, those associations typically offer, offer goodies, so to speak. So they offer discounts on advertising and maybe, you know, the big quarterly magazine that they put out, or they offer digital advertising and you can do fractional ads on the association webpage. And those things come at a discount to you because you are already a member. So I would really dig deep and see what your benefits are as, as part of that membership to see if you can maximize it for book sales in any way, shape or form. Oh, yeah. Another idea, and we're just throwing out ideas because every book is different and every book, you know, deserves a special place. But if you are working with an association and you happen to be, you know, doing a speaking engagement with them, it's a really good idea to create a specialty um, edition for this event. So you can always discuss with the event coordinator and say like, hey, you know, I'd love to speak at your, your event. Would you be interested in buying 30 copies that we can, you know, maybe print a letter from the association president as a gift to the recipient. And those are really simple ways that you can create a special edition of your book, sell a copy of your book. And those are, those tend to be non-refundable, non-returnable. Sorry. They do. And, you know, you can tier the discounts for those people. Mm -hmm. Uh, I love doing this for associations or speaking events or corporate buys, Um, you know, make it worth your while. So say, Hey, you know, if you want to buy up to 100 copies, I'll give you a 30% discount. If you want to buy one to 300 copies, I'll go up to, you know, 45 or 50%. Make it really worth it for them. Say, hey, if you take a thousand copies, I'm going to give those to you for 55 to 60% off. Because again, this is not necessarily, um, I won't say it's not a money maker. It is, but it's more about volume and it's more about getting really strong reach when you're selling to associations and and events and such. So always bake it in, always make it worth it for them. And you, know, you might even do kind of a Kickstarter style situation there too, where you're saying, okay, if you buy 200 books, then I will do like a, I'll do a 30 minute virtual Zoom session with yes. teams or you know, offer, offer them little goodies that don't really cost you money. They just cost you maybe a little bit of your time um, as lead gen. And then you can sell more books that way. Oh yeah, absolutely. And as a disclaimer, I do want to note that we were talking about discounts to retailers, that discount is based off the MSRP, not your cost. So keep that in mind. That's how you make money. Yep, exactly. Think like a publisher, always. Always like a publisher. Make sure that your bottom line makes sense and then make sure that your audience is the right audience. You know, Um, you'd be surprised where you can find a, a, a book randomly in a random store in a random place that you didn't expect. But let's talk about the place that we're always looking at books 
you know, especially when we're traveling during the season and then our Kindle isn't charged or our ebook, you know, we forgot our paperbacks. Where do we go? Oh, we go to everybody's favorite, the airport bookstore. It's my favorite. It That's time gonna... suck in the airport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got that layover. You're going to want to distract yourself. For sure. Yes. Oh my goodness. This is such a weedy topic. I can't wait to get into it. Uh, let's break down the myth of airport book sales. Um, myth number one is that those sales are final. Uh, oof. Ooh, they are not. And here's why most airport sales are pay to play. They are considered what we call in the business co-op, which means that you are paying them money to distribute or not distribute, but to display. And unless you are like a Malcolm Gladwell or one of these people who are always in the bookstores, um, these are finite, limited opportunities. So you might get co-op for a month. You might get it for a season. Um, and really, the buy is not that big. The buy is maybe, what, five to 800 units? Yeah, across all the airports. Right. So, you know, maybe one or two in every Hudson and major airports in the United States. So. You pay to do it, um, again, unless you're our already proven big wig author. Um, and it is, it is wonderful. It's great visibility. Your store or your store, your book is in the stores. It's getting tons of, of foot traffic that they wouldn't normally see. Um, so that's awesome. But I would never, never, never count on airport buy as something that's going to make you a ton of money because it's really a marketing opportunity more than a sales opportunity. Yes. So you had mentioned, actually, this is this is the best part. This is the, I don't want to say it's a gotcha, but this is something to consider. Your opportunity at the airport is for a limited time. So it's, you know, it's either you're contracted for a month or three months or, you know, depending on what uh, season it is, because books are sold in seasonality. Um, but then what happens to your books, those 800, 500 copies that went out to all the Hudson stores in the U.S.? After that month is over. Oh, uh, you're going to get them back. <laughs> <laughs> and and they won't be in great shape. Spoiler alert. Um, yeah. they, really, they really won't. So I think if, if being in an airport is important to you, and again, this is mostly for our business authors, because that's the, other than fiction, that's the big get at airport bookstores, unless it's something very, you know, splashy nonfiction like, like the Magnolia Table book, I think that I mentioned earlier, you know, something that's got a very, very, very broad nonfiction appeal. Nonfiction um, memoirs. It's the season. Yeah, right. So, you know, like the Matthew Perry book, that one's going to be in airports. I guarantee it. Um, Jason Kander's book is probably in a lot of airports, at least in the mm -hmm. Midwest. So, you know, biography and books like that. But for business authors, you really have to think of it as, okay, this is a marketing opportunity for me. Yeah. And a finite so, one at that. Oh, yeah. And and get ready to spend the, into the five and six figures, depending on, you know, the outlet and, and, and be emotionally prepared for when those books come back. Right. Right. Now, I know a lot of authors who they are also frequent travelers. And so they will go and they will stop in and they will offer to sign their book when it's in Hudson's. And usually the people in Hudson's are very sweet. You know, they're they're going to let you do it. And sometimes that means it won't get returned, but not always. Yes. But if you do decide to do that, you know, and really this goes for anything. If you do decide to walk into a specialty store or a local store that is somewhat, you know, topic adjacent, they have the ancillary products is something that you're doing and that your book is related to. Don't just ask them to carry your book, actually support the store. And that's, you know, shop local, shop indie. And that's something that we um, you know, in, in the business are, are always pushing for because we need those extra outlets outside of Amazon, outside of Barnes and Noble, outside of the traditional places so that, you know, more books get into the hands of people. I'd like to be, you know, optimistic and think like, yes, maybe book buying is down for a little bit, but that's because it's the holiday season. It's not because people stopped reading. People still read. Oh, they absolutely do. And and now's a great time to really see, to go out there and do a little research. If you're not quite ready to put your book out into those, those arenas, use this holiday season as your research time. Go out and see if they are selling other people's books. You know, if your local kitchen store is selling a local author's cookbook, 
Yes. Ask some questions. Really use this time because this is, I mean, people are making, you know, 70% of their income, many, many stores do in this two to three month period. And so now's the time they are also pulling out all the stops to sell stuff. So yeah, take notes, (laughs) ask questions, make friends. And when you do get a bite and you do get either, you know, like an association or an independent store or whatever to carry your book, as, as you mentioned, Vanessa, make it a relationship. Don't make it transactional. Make it something that's going to last beyond the sale of this book. So, you know, amplify them on your own social media. Talk them up when you talk about, you know, where your book is being sold. Offer a buy link to their store if it's available. Um, make it a really good, solid relationship so that when you come back to them to buy more, they're going to be more willing to do that. And it won't be just a one-time thing. Absolutely. I, I think... For Samantha Irby's last book, I'm on her newsletter. So she actually went in and signed a very limited quantity of books at her um, local or one of her favorite indie bookstores. And in her email, it said, buy copies from this bookstore and you will get a signed edition. And that's the only Mm -hmm. place. And that was just so great because it was like an independent bookstore that I'd never heard of. And I was like, yeah, okay, I'll support. And it's just like going to Amazon. It's just you know, we need to shop local. We need to keep these things going because we all need a a place and a home and, you know, take advantage of the fact that Barnes and Noble is now shopping Mm hyper-local. They are looking for local authors, not just Barnes and Noble, but like Books A Million. If you're in Canada, Indigo. Right. Absolutely. The, The options are just absolutely endless. And so, you know, I always say never try to throw, just throw spaghetti to the wall and see if it sticks. Like, do your research. Um, so do that. Um, really make make yourself a student of how these these different booksellers work and associations and conferences, if that's your jam, if you're a conference person. Um, just get in, get in the weeds and see what you find. And if it only moves a hundred books, that's fine. You're moving a hundred books, but you're reaching more and more people by just making those interactions. One hundred percent. Never stop selling. Never stop selling. Always be closing. Oh, oh, that's it. (laughs) Always be closing. And yeah, I would, if you're thinking about this being the holiday season, I would definitely look at the way that retailers just, you know, just a little tidbit. Look at how retailers start selling you merchandise for Christmas in Mm -hmm. July, because that's the right time to do it. That's the right time to get in front of people. The You know, the seasonality, yes, it is at the end of the year, but it starts in the middle of the year. It does. It's a wonky place. It's very wonky. And you know what? Speaking of that, here's a a last minute tip. All of those catalogs that we get in the mail for holiday stuff, they're kind of funky, random, you know, like the ones that used to be on the airplanes. I forget what those were called. It was just like a bunch of random. Sharper image? Yeah, that was one. There was another one. I forget what it was. But anyway, there are all kinds of of catalogs that go out um, that are for different kind of specialty groups. Like, you know, there's some that are toy catalogs or uh, cooking catalogs. I just got my Zabar's catalog this week. I'm very excited. So if you have a book that might be a good fit for like a certain holiday gift guide, why not, you know, shoot them an email, see how you can pitch it. And maybe you can get into some really great catalog spaces too. Oh yeah. The snail mail is a good place to be. It still goes. It still sells. Well, I think that that I think that was a lot of information for for the audience for today. It's 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 a very good topic. You know, think outside the box, think outside the box retailers and go talk to your indie bookstore sellers and indie specialty. Go to talk to your mom and pops is basically what we're saying. Yep. (laughs) Choices are are, are not just bookstores and and Amazon. Go out there, explore, have a conversation. Do and let us know how it goes. Drop us a note. We're on socials. We're at Broad Book Group. Let us know where you're selling your book right now and how that's working out for you. Yes, please. Well, I'm off. I'm off to go find a cocktail. Uh, so <laughs> have, a, have a great weekend. Uh, we want to thank our producer, Paul Roberts, uh, and our executive producer, Emily Carpenter, Pulls Camp of Little Red Communications. And thanks to my dog, Mabel, who snored through this entire show, and you can probably hear it. It was we a nice little hum. It was. <laughs> we'll see you next time. We 
hope that you gained some valuable insights into the world of book publishing. Head over to broadbookgroup.com to learn more about us and all our services. And be sure to check out all our social media at Broad Book Group. Until then, keep publishing.